Good morning and welcome to this webinar on artificial intelligence and lawyers. My name is Jonathan Goldsmith and I work with the European Lawyers Foundation. I'm going to make a few announcements at the beginning whilst we're waiting for people to come in. We have a very full house and they will be coming in in the opening minutes. So this is a webinar which is organized by the European Lawyers Foundation and the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCBE on artificial intelligence and lawyers, what you need to know now. Now, the first thing to note is that we really welcome if you use the chat function to say hello and tell us where you're from. But you, we do not want the chat function to be used for questions, please. There is a question and answer box, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. And we would ask you to use the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen for putting questions to the speakers in English. Uh, we really welcome questions uh, and we will try and answer them all if time allows at the end of each session or the end of the webinar itself. The questions should be put in English. This webinar is uh, going to be in English without interpretation. The webinar will be recorded. Uh, many questions are asked of us about uh, whether certificates are issued for the purposes of continuing legal education. We ourselves do not issue certificates, but you, the participants, can contact your bar and ask whether the bar will recognize the training. If the bar does recognize the training, then we, the European Lawyers Foundation, can share with the bar uh, the participant list of lawyers so that they can see that you have participated. So we don't issue the certificates. Please contact your bar, but we will tell the bar that you have participated. And finally, before we begin, uh, we have slides today for the webinar. Uh, the slides, I have looked at them, are really very full of useful material and useful references. They will be put on the European Lawyers Foundation website together with the recorded video of this webinar once the video is ready, and that will be at the end of this week, and you can check on our social media accounts when that will be, but it should be by the end of the week. That is the end of the announcements. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who will uh, provide an introduction, and that is the president of the CCBE, Panagiotis Perakis. Uh, you're very welcome, Panagiotis, welcome. If you could welcome our participants, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jonathan. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, good morning. It is my utmost pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on the intersection of artificial intelligence and the legal profession. Today, we gather here to explore the transformative potential of AI tools within the justice system and the imperative to ensure that these tools respect key principles and fundamental rights, such as the right to a fair trial. In recent years, we have witnessed a remarkable surge in the development and application of artificial intelligence in various domains. The legal profession, being an integral pillar, pillar of our society is no exception. AI has the capacity to revolution, revolutionize the way we approach legal challenges, streamline processes, and enhance access to justice. However, as we embark upon this journey, we must be vigilant and proactive in addressing the ethical considerations that arise. The first point I would like to emphasize is that AI tools used in the justice system must adhere to key principles and must respect fundamental rights. As we discuss the use of AI by the legal profession, it is vital that we prioritize ethical frameworks and design AI systems that are aligned with our societal values. We must invest in research and development that scrutinizes the ethical implications of AI. 
ensuring its compliance with principles such as fairness, accountability, and transparency. Collaboration among stakeholders, including legal professionals, policymakers, technology specialists, and ethics experts is paramount to navigate this path wisely. The second point I would like to stress is the human factor. While AI undoubtedly possesses immense potential, we must remember that the ultimate decision-making power should reside with humans. AI should serve as an aid to human-driven decision-making rather than a replacement of it. Legal professionals bring not only their expertise in the law, but also their empathy and understanding of the human condition. It is this blend of legal skills and compassion that ensures justice is served with due consideration for the nuances of each case. My third and last point is that the time is ripe to have these discussions. We are meeting at the time when the EU is negotiating our first law in the world that aims to regulate the development and use of AI. I'm therefore particularly pleased that we have with us today a representative of the European Commission to talk us through the proposed law and the key concepts that underpin it. We are also witnessing the negotiations of the first convention on AI in the Council of Europe and the EU-US transatlantic cooperation on trustworthy AI. RCCCB would not only follow all these developments around AI, but also want to be present in the discussion because we consider it an important issue for us, for the justice system, and for the human society. That is why, in continuation of the work we have been doing for a long time now on AI, I took the initiative that led to our recent statement on AI, which our Secretary General Simone Simone, Simone Cuomo will shortly present to you in a while. I therefore wish you fruitful discussions and encourage you to exchange of ideas during this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panagiotis. Thank you for your welcome. And I just uh, repeat what you've just said. What I said at the beginning is that we really welcome questions. Please put the questions in the question and answer box and they will be, will be dealt with. But we move next to our first substantive session. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome, as you yourself mentioned, Panagiotis, that we have a representative here from the European Commission. She is Jordanka Ivanova, who is a legal and policy officer from DG Connect at the European Commission in the unit responsible for AI policy development and coordination. She is one of the team members who drafted the Commission proposal for the AI, AI Act and follows now the ongoing negotiations with the Council and the Parliament. She also follows international activities related to AI, including in particular cooperation with the OECD and Council of Europe. So you can see she's well placed to introduce the EU AI Act. So, Jordanka, over to you, please. Will you go ahead and share your slides with us? Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you with so many legal professionals. Um, so indeed, my task today will be to briefly present to you the first comprehensive uh, uh, EU proposal for artificial intelligence regulation, um, which is uh, very relevant also for the justice system, um, but also, um, also for all the challenges that were mentioned um, as something that both legal professionals and also um, people, businesses have to do when AI is put into service. Um, so um, without further ado, just a very brief uh, Back, um, background, um, as you probably know, in April 2021, the Commission put forward um, this package, uh, which aims to build both trust and excellence in artificial intelligence, because we do think this technology is very promising. Um, and for competitiveness of companies, but also for the common group and a, a group, uh, good and addressing some of the biggest challenges. Uh, but we also recognize that there are certain risks and challenges, and that's why we propose both a coordinated plan, which aims to help uh, companies 
and everyone uh, develop and benefit uh, from the technology, but also a proposal for a legal, legal regulation to, to manage the risks um, and create common harmonized rules uh, for the EU. So this AI Act um, is now as in, in a key stage of the legislative process um, because the Council already achieved its position uh, last year in December. And now on the 14th of June, the Parliament also uh, voted um, its report. Uh, so we are already now starting the trilogues uh, where the two co-legislators together with the commission will aim to finalize and agree on a final draft um, and that's why i'm very pleased also because uh, uh, your input of ccbe but also of uh, everyone and relevant questions are will be very useful for us in this critical stage the ambition is very high and given all the urgencies and all the latest, especially technological developments, um, now really the ambition is to finalize the trilogues and adopt the act uh, by the end of the year, uh, early next year, the latest, because we also have uh, parliamentary elections next year. So um, very basic introduction to the AI Act. As I said, this is a regulation, so it would be directly applicable with harmonized rules um, in all EU 27 member states. Um, it's based as a product safety legislation regulating the AI system as such, but it covers the full AI life cycle, including then with requirements, the design, um, and it's also horizontal in scope um, because many of the challenges that when we were discussing we we made the assessment that instead of having many sectoral rules that could be conflicting take time um it's most useful to have certain horizontal principles and common framework for that would be applicable to all sectors and it has two main objectives to address risks uh, to safety health and fundamental rights including all fundamental rights that are relevant also as was mentioned uh, with fair trial effective remedy um, presumption of innocence and others for the justice sector specifically. Um, and the other objective is to create the single market for trustworthy AI systems in the EU. So um, companies have legal certainty, um, but also there is trust in the market and there are uh, clear legal framework, uh, both for people affected, but uh, also for uh, those who are developing and using those technologies. And this regulation um, would aim to apply to both uh, actors in the EU developing and using uh, AI technologies, but also to those who are outside the EU, uh, as well as they are placing their systems on the EU market, including as provision of services. So the objective is to create a level playing field and actually capture technology providers who are often now a bit um, not clearly ready regulated with the existing rules. Um, so the approach is uh, risk-based uh, because we do think that um, there is a need for proportionate rules. Uh, risks are not the same depending on different use cases, contexts of use. So this is um, um, our risk pyramid that shows that for the different risk layers, there are different rules. If you look at the bottom, um, there is the green layer, uh, which is actually, according to the initial commission proposal, the majority of the existing use cases where there are risks, uh, but they are not so significant and that the existing legislation could be enough. Uh, so there are no additional principles or rules, but there is the possibility to adhere to voluntary codes of conduct, including for different sectors. And here what, what CCBE and others have been doing for the legal profession, we think is really, really useful because you could actually build on our common principles and also target them to your sector and apply them even to use cases that would not be directly regulated by the regulation. Then there is the yellow layer uh, where there is certain risk of um, manipulation or deception. So the objective here is that people should always be informed if they are, for example, interacting with an AI system like a chatbot or if they are exposed to deep fake or emotion recognition or biometric categorization systems because of the risks of manipulation and deception uh, that could um, be uh, 
um, uh, that could follow. And then um, there is the orange category, which is the main uh, core of the uh, of the proposal, uh, regulated with mandatory clear requirements and rules, um, uh, high risk AI systems. These are specific use cases that the Commission has identified already in our assessment that would be subjected ex ante before they can be actually placed on the European market or used to special requirements and conformity assessment procedures and also export controls. Uh, so I'll talk more about this category because it's quite relevant for the justice system and actually these are the core new requirements that we propose but just uh, before that also mentioning that on the on the top of the pyramid uh, there are also a few use cases where the commission has proposed to prohibit them um where, uh, for example, social scoring is done by public authorities, there is harmful manipulative practices or the use of real time remote biometric um, identification system for law enforcement purposes with certain exceptions. So this risk pyramid, um, it's both something that the Council and the Parliament agrees on. And um, of course, there are certain uh, additional specifications, so I'll talk more about them. Um, and here, I think it would be also relevant um, to mention what would be specific impact for the justice system uh, and the legal sector. Because as I said, um, these high risk use cases, we have tried already to identify them in the legal proposal. So we give maximum legal certainty um, to both providers and users if they would be considered high risk. Um, on one hand, we have all products, regulated products where AI is a safety component like a medical device, machines and others. But there are also these categories of uh, standalone AI system in certain areas where we think that they are primarily fundamental rights implications. And here you see uh, eight broad categories for biometric identification, management of operation of critical infrastructure, employment, education, access uh, to essential private and public services, law enforcement, quite important. Also, a lot of the use cases uh, here for individual risk assessment, but also AI used for profiling and others um, would be covered. AI also used in migration, asylum, and finally, um, AI used in administration of justice and democratic processes. So for these broad categories, as I mentioned, we've tried to give a lot of legal certainty, so already identify specific use cases. And what's most relevant for the justice and legal system, um, if we exclude the law enforcement, um, this is the use case in the final category, which are AI systems intended to assist the judicial authority in researching and interpreting facts and the law and in applying the law to a concrete set of facts. So, this use case now that has been proposed, just to mention that um, uh, to keep the regulation future proof, the Commission could also add more use cases in the future. So also your input in general, um, because also a lot has happened, uh, but also for the future, even after the AI Act is adopted, would be very useful, especially to keep uh, all abreast of all the risks or relevant use cases in the justice system. Now, in our proposal, it's important indeed to say that yes it would be only AI used to assist judicial authorities um, and here uh, one of the recitals says that um, this should not extend to systems intended for purely administrative uh, tasks um, um, and then um, yes one relevant question for the legal profession is that in general legal services uh, because actually lawyers are not judicial authorities, they are not covered in the other category that I mentioned, access to essential public and private services. So at, at this stage of the proposal and also of the negotiations, as we have seen them, legal services would not be subjected to mandatory new requirements, but there would be voluntary codes of conduct, for example, possible, as I mentioned before. Of course, the existing legislation and ethical standards that already apply to legal services would continue 
continue to apply whenever AI use. So um, yes, of course, I, I see I've seen a lot of recommendations, I, and I think they are very relevant to a bit guide already how to comply with those existing standards and legislation when AI is used. And actually, developing voluntary codes of conduct could be something we think we really would support. The Parliament uh, has proposed to extend this use case also to cover administrative body and also not only judicial decision making, but also alternative dispute resolution. And they have added one important recital, which I have also seen as recommendation from the CCBE uh, white paper that the use of AI tools can support but should never replace the decision making power of judges judicial and or judicial independence. Uh, so that's uh, that's quite relevant and recognized also in the parliament and already it says that it should only assist and contrary to other use cases, it does not aim to take the decision themselves. And the parliament has also added an important element for the supervision that the market surveillance activities of the supervisory authorities um, uh, that will aim to comply with the AI Act requirements shall in no way affect the independence of the judicial authorities. So this is also quite important. And these high-risk AI systems, they will have um, uh, to comply with um, um, requirements that are very much um, uh, existing good practices and principles for many areas like risk assessment and risk management to identify and mitigate risks to, uh, to fundamental rights, uh, including by prior testing of the system that the use of good quality training, validation and testing data sets, implement uh, data governance procedures um, to avoid biases um, and uh, discrimination, establish proper documentation, and also design the system with logging features that would allow the traceability or auditability of the system, ensure appropriate degree of transparency and interpretability, which is key, as is also mentioned in the CCBE paper, to enable the users to understand the system and to explain also its output, um, and also to we require the technology providers to provide specific information with instructions of use to users so they understand the system capabilities, limitations, potential risks. Um, next very important requirement is the human oversight, especially in the justice uh, field um, that should aim to minimize any residual risk. And there are indeed also recommendations and requirements that uh, people using the system should not over rely, should always check um, um, the, the outcome. Um, so it should be indeed perceived as a tool and humans should be always in control and taking the final responsibility. Um, an important requirement for robustness, accuracy, and reliability, of course, it's important that the system do what they promise to do and cybersecurity, which is also relevant for the confidentiality um, uh, protection. And these requirements, the objective is because they are quite a high level in the regulation, but um, currently the Commission has uh, requested the European standardization organizations to develop technical standards that would actually help technology providers uh, comply with them. And there are also other provisions uh, and obligations. So the main responsibility is, as I said, on the technology providers who should ensure compliance with these requirements, do also ex ante conformity checks before they place them on the market, um, have quality management, uh, but also register those systems in an extreme a public database and have post-market monitoring and a serious incident reporting system. Um, and on the users, on the other hand, maybe that would be mainly the justice sector and the, in the legal professionals, if they would be uh, covered at all, uh, they would have just to follow the instructions to so abuse, do human oversight and um, report um, instruct, um, incidents, but also, of course, these obligations are on the top of already existing or relevant sectoral laws, how they should uh, um, do um, um, 
their main tasks and comply with data protection, non-discrimination and, and other relevant uh, laws. So one of the key points, as I said, all of this is more or less very much agreed between both the council and the parliament, but there are of course certain key points for discussion now, for example, on the prohibition that is one of the most relevant area uh, where the um, council um, extended a bit the exceptions that we initially proposed to the prohibition of real-time remote biometric identification for law enforcement purposes in public spaces because their main concern is for law enforcement authorities and their ability to use this technology um, uh, also for security purposes while we see in the parliament that actually they put much more focus to restrict and they actually completely prohibited without exception the use of real-time remote biometric identification and in addition they subjected the post uh, not real-time but exposed use of uh, those tools uh, to prior judicial authorization so this gives much more more um, oversight and restriction of how this technology can be used. The parliament has also proposed new prohibition, uh, for example, this predictive policing that we uh, was initially in the commission proposal as high risk is now proposed to be prohibited when it's really for individual people, biometric categorization based on sensitive data, emotion recognition, also they propose to prohibit in several areas like employment, um, and also scraping of online uh, images. On the high risk use cases, also there, um, there are um, differences between the two co-legislators. For example, the council has deleted three use cases in the law enforcement and the uh, and the migration sector, but they added health and life insurance and digital infrastructure. On the other hand, the parliament has proposed quite a few new use cases um, uh, to cover also emotion recognition when not prohibited, um, 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 prediction of migration, uh, AI in election processes, recommend the system by very large online platforms, um, health and life insurance, um, as I said. Um, and the interesting point is that both the council and the parliament proposed to add an additional filter to already the way the commission specified the the risk use the high risk use cases so the parliament um, proposes that every provider should do an additional self assessment and if they consider that the use case is not posing high risk they could consult the national authorities so this could bring some legal uncertainty and also quite some burden on the authorities and probably inconsistency but we understand a bit that both want to somehow restrict uh, the, um, the scope of the use cases. The council, on the other hand, uh, proposed that um, they should not be qualified uh, as high risk if the output of the system is just of an accessory nature for the final decision, which seems a bit more clear cut um, exception to, uh, to what the parliament proposed. Um, now there are also important differences because both co-legislators also propose additional obligations and remedies. Um, and for public authorities, uh, one important additional obligation is also the users who are public authorities of high risk care systems should register their use in the AI database. And the council also proposed that there, uh, that everyone, uh, including affected people, should should have right to complain to the market surveillance authorities. Um, also, the council, the parliament has proposed similar new additions, but even more, they also uh, require um, that users of high risk AI systems should also individually inform affected persons about the use, and they should also do a fundamental rights impact assessment on the top already of the data protection impact assessment, but that could be combined with it. Um, and they also require that users should also give explanations to, to people affected by the, by the high risk AI system use. And they also add a bit more remedies. Uh, so on the top of the, uh, the complaint, they also add judicial remedy. They also add possibilities for collective redress, protection for whistleblowers, and I, as I said, the right to an explanation. On the governance framework, there, um, there is also um, the parliament putting a bit more emphasis 
emphasis on a stronger EU body. We proposed initially an AI board, which they now want to have a, as AI office, and sh it should be independent, well with resourced, with legal personality, and then want to give a bit more tasks. One very relevant also uh, point for discussion between the colleges later now is the um, also, that might be also interesting for you, is are the so-called general purpose AI systems or foundation models, because, um, as I said, uh, the initial commission approach was really to focus on specific use cases, but with chat GPT, with many other foundation models and uh, very um, advanced uh, uh, systems that can be used in variety of contexts, uh, we see that actually this is the trend and the basic layer now and really where competitiveness is going. So also um, there was a concern that actually the providers of those systems could just take those models and want to use them for a high risk use case, they would not be capable to comply with the new requirements for data quality documentation if they, there is no certain cooperation or share of responsibility with those upstream provider of the powerful models and systems. So that's why the two co-legislators both proposed a bit different approaches. The council um, uh, uh, requested that every time that um, such general purpose AI system could be used in a high risk context, so when the provider doesn't explicitly exclude the use, um, they could be subjected to similar requirements as the one I mentioned before, uh, but that should be adapted by the Commission in Implementing Act, so they already, uh, what is within their control, they could manage uh, as risk and that they should also collaborate with the downstream providers. Now the part Yodanka, Yodanka, I'm going to I'm going to stop you uh, because we have a number of questions and I really would like to 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 go through the question. So if that's all right with you. Um, yes. Thank you. The first question from Joao Quintas, I don't think it's for you as a general question, so I'm going to just read it out, but and I'd like all the speakers to consider it. It's I'd like to know the opinion of the speakers on emerging properties. He may mean emergent abilities, I don't know. I'm not an expert from AI. Uh, Peter, Peter's got his hand up. Peter, you will deal with that later. Thank you. Uh, but there are some specific questions for you, uh, Jordanka. So I will just so there are two from Carl Lauer. Social scoring by public authorities is classified as high risk. What about social scoring by other entities, for example, by non-profit organizations? Uh, well, actually, uh, social scoring is uh, already proposed to be prohibited uh, when it's by public authorities. And what both the council and the parliament did is that they extended this prohibition also to the private sector. So uh, it's not only if the system is used by public authorities, but also by private companies, for example. But social scoring is defined a bit in a restricted manner where there is um, unjustified differential treatment. So it, it's not just any evaluation uh, of, of people. So that's why um, it's, it, it's not so broad, but what the parliament and council propose is also to apply it to private actors. Thank you. Uh, we'll come to a, a question from somebody else. I'll come back to Carl's second question. Maxim Greinerman says, is the use of AI by intelligence services to be regulated or explicitly excluded under national security grounds? Yes, that's uh, one very important. Another point, as I mentioned, council is really concerned and they put a lot of exception for the law enforcement in general, but also they propose to put one very broad exception for national security in general from the scope of the AI Act in general. So, because actually in the initial commission proposal that was not excluded, but as you know, there is a lot of case law from the Court of Justice of the EU that interprets very restrictively any exclusion from the scope of EU law for those um, uses. So that's why member states now really want to put explicitly in every regulation quite broad exclusions. And that was also in the council proposal. So it will be important to follow what will happen in the negotiations. Right. Thank you. I would like to ask Carl Lauer's second question. 
but I, actually I see it's been removed uh, and I can't now find it. So I will uh, go to another question, uh, which uh, from Jacek Kowalewski, who said, you said that final decisions should not be taken by AI. Has the European Commission conducted some research for instance, ethical research that would support this choice or assumption? Uh, well, of course, this is, um, as I mentioned, um, specific more for the justice system. Um, now, as I mentioned it, uh, human oversight, uh, the way it's defined in the regulation, it doesn't exclude fully automated decisions, but it does require people when they need to exercise this human oversight. So it will depend a lot the standard from the sectoral rules. Like for the justice specifically, we, we do agree with also the recommendations that this should be mainly, of course, because we have under the existing legislation and standards, always the need to have a human judge. And we agree with you that this should not be fully automated. So that's a relevant case, but uh, there are of course examples where we could have fully automated decisions depending on the different sectoral rules in, in other sectors and that cannot be fully excluded. So um, because it's a horizontal legislation, it mainly actually builds on, on standards and rights and principles that already regulate the different use cases in, in the sectors. Very good, thank you. There are further questions here, uh, which we will keep and we may come back to if there is time. Uh, we should move on because we've, uh, we've got, um, uh, we've got other speakers that we need to, to deal with. I'd like to thank you, Jordanka, very much. Uh, there are a number of uh, points in the chat. Will the slides be available? Yes, the slides will be available on the European Lawyers Foundation website. Uh, and yes, the recording of this um, uh, webinar will also be on the European Lawyers uh, Foundation website. So you can go back and look at, at those things. We should make progress. Uh, I'm sorry, we need to be quick, otherwise we will uh, lose time. So I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, who is Simone Cuomo who's the Secretary General of the CCBE, who is one of the co-organizers of today's conference. Uh, he's been working with the CCBE since 2010 and Secretary General since 2020. Um, and uh, he does, he's been doing policy advocacy towards the EU on a range of, 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 of uh, policy areas, um, as well as to the Council of Europe. And he's been very closely associated with the CCBE's policy developments on digitalization of justice and main focus on translating lawyers' needs in electronic judicial proceedings. Simone, welcome. Uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And also thank you to Jordanka for the very clear uh, presentation on the AI Act. Um, so I will share my screen. I also have a presentation to show, so I hope that will work. You see my screen? My yes, slides. But it's not full screen. We see it. Yeah, that's better. Yes. Now, yes, yes, that's, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Simone, are you there? Yes, I think I'm back. You are Sorry. back, and there's a big black patch. Of, ah, that's it. Perfect. Please go ahead, Simone. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my second screen just went black, so <laughs> it's a little bit of improvisation. But nevertheless, uh, just to start off with uh, representing uh, quickly, um, presenting quickly the CCBE. So the CCBE is basically the umbrella organization of all the bars and law societies of Europe. We have in our membership the EU countries as full members, as well as the um, European Economic Area countries. So also uh, Norway, Liechtenstein, Iceland, they are part of our full membership. And um, through our members, we represent more than uh, 1 million lawyers and we mostly do um, advocacy work, uh, but also 
uh, participate in various uh, projects with the EU institutions. And we follow closely policy developments that have an impact on the legal profession. And, um, and, and we make then also the position of the profession known to the relevant um, uh, institutional uh, actors. Um, so we have been also addressing in that context also um, uh, the, the, the rise of artificial intelligence and how that impacts on the legal profession, how that impacts in particular injustice, if it's, if it's going to be used in justice, um, and how does that impact also on uh, legal practice. And for this reason, we also did um, a project uh, two years ago. Uh, we started that project, AI for Lawyers. And on this slide, you see a few deliverables from that project, uh, the first three bullet points. Uh, the most important one is the guide on the use of AI tools by uh, lawyers and law firms in the EU. And Peter Homoki will go into the details on that. Uh, but this is, of course, uh, freely available uh, on our website and also through the links of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, which, which will also be made available. And you see also some more background studies, um, which will also be presented later on in another presentation in this webinar. Um, what I will go into is especially the policy papers that we have uh, been um, working on. And the first one was the um, CCBE considerations on the legal aspects of AI. Um, and there I would like to uh, basically zoom in, first of all, on the use of AI by courts um, and, and to a little bit set out how we see the potential issues arising in that context and, um, and, and give some, some explanation of, of our reasoning in that regard. So first of all, uh, we can imagine uh, courts using artificial intelligence and to some extent some are already uh, using it to a limited extent in various contexts of a trial. Uh, so in the management and the follow up of files, uh, that's the first column that you see. This is, by the way, a, uh, also a page on the document uh, which is referred to at the bottom. You see the CCB consideration on the legal aspects of AI. So you will find this table there. Um, then in the um, uh, can be used at pre-trial states uh, and then also of course uh, during the trial stage through the use of, of uh, video conferencing automated transcription uh, case management um, and and also even use of emotional ai uh, that, that could potentially be used i'm not saying that, that it is used already but of course it could be used or considered to be used in future and then, of course, in the judge's deliberation or the decision-making uh, process. Um, so there you have a range of uh, potential tools um, uh, to be used. Uh, and then, of course, at, at post-trial state to, in the follow-up uh, of the execution of decisions. And there we already see, for example, tools used for uh, anonymization of court decisions, for example. So I will, uh, in my follow-up now, zoom in in particular on the potential use of uh, AI in the judge's uh, decision-making process, so the third column. And in order to, yeah, a little bit uh, understand uh, why we, um, we see some issues arising in that context, it's probably just good to first reflect on the key aspects of the court's decision-making process. And this is, of course, not new to you, but nevertheless, I want to just uh, quickly go over this uh, because it is very relevant um, when, when also then assessing how AI could impact uh, that process. Um, so firstly, uh, decisions are made after due hearing of the parties, uh, ensuring then fairness and thorough examination of all the evidence that is uh, presented. Because, of course, when deciding a case, a judge relies on what the parties present uh, in terms of facts, in terms of evidence, arguments, case law, et cetera. Um, and this process is then commonly referred to as the principle of adversarial proceedings, where basically every party uh, can present, but also debate in the presence of the judge, the arguments put forward uh, by uh, the uh, the other party. 
Moreover, decisions are made by the judge themselves and not delegated to any third parties. And they must also be re uh, rendered by a judge which is impartial, acting in a fair manner towards all the uh, parties uh, without favor or bias or prejudice. And finally, uh, decisions are reasoned and explained, uh, ensuring that there is transparency and accountability in the decision-making process, making it then possible, of course, for the parties involved to understand which legal uh, precedents uh, and arguments justify uh, the decision. So, um, as I mentioned, I, 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 yeah, it is, it is, it is important to 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 realize this, these key elements in a, in a decision making process. To then look at the potential uh, issues that arise when AI tools are used, and we do believe that due to their inherent nature and characteristics, these tools uh, have the potential uh, to really disrupt the dynamics of the process, which I just uh, set out to you. But firstly, this is due to uh, the, the use of data and elements that have not been subject uh, of an adversarial debate among uh, the parties involved. Also, the use of conclusions uh, produced uh, by AI tools that have not been obtained through the reasoning of the judge, which leads then to a kind of transfer uh, or part of a uh, transfer of the decision making power to the judge, uh, from the judge, sorry, from the judge to the machine. Another concern is the lack of transparency of the process, since it becomes impossible to know uh, what uh, should be attributed then to the judge and what is the outcome of the AI tool. There can also be a lack of level playing field, um, or what we also call uh, uh, an inequality of arms, uh, for example, because the prosecution office um, could have possibly advanced cap uh, capacities to analyze huge data sets, which the defense perhaps does not possess, and thereby uh, he, uh, the defense is put at a significant disadvantage. Another problem that can arise is the undermining of the principle of impartiality due to the impossibility of really knowing the biases that um, uh, were built into the system by uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, by the system designers. And finally, there can be also then a breach of the principle of explicability because of the existence of results produced by AI tools that are really beyond human reasoning and cannot be, uh, cannot be traced. Because, of course, that is the particularity of AI tools is, is really the difficulty to understand how they achieve the, the results they produce. And especially when it comes to judicial decisions, this is obviously um, a problem uh, where uh, decisions have to be justified and understood by the parties and also by society. Um, and so therefore, uh, we believe that the use of AI tool could potentially uh, lead to a radical reconsideration of the rules which we have just been referring to, um, uh, which is a problem because these basic principles underpinning the judicial process, they are therefore good reasons and they are also uh, protected by uh, the EU Charter and by the European Convention of Human Rights. So we therefore uh, believe that, uh, in, that when introducing um, AI tools, certain requirements uh, must be met. And I uh, am pleased also already to have heard from the commission the latest state of play regarding the AI Act, because uh, that is one of the key elements which we believe is that AI tools um, must be thoroughly controlled and regulated. Um, secondly, these rules that uh, govern uh, AI tools, they must be grounded on a, a clear set of ethical principles, which are set beforehand. And there are already a, a certain set of principles set by the European Commission on the Efficiency of Justice, the Ethical Charter, Charter on the Use of AI in Judicial Systems, provides a good basis, but these ethical rules obviously also have to uh, still be evolved uh, and, and reviewed in the context also of the latest uh, developments, uh, especially in regard to, to the rise of um, the latest rise of, of generative AI tools such as, uh, such as uh, ChatGPT. 
Um, and these principles must also be turned then into uh, specific um, uh, operational rules and guidelines that really must be followed when AI tools are introduced in practice. So there must be use case specific rules. So not just general principles, which for example, the AI Act is now uh, if eventually adopted going to provide, uh, but then there must be also operational use uh, for each specific tool when especially when I'm talking here about the use of, a, of AI tools in justice. And we believe that in justice, there must be uh, specific rules for each um, AI tool that is used, especially in the decision-making process. Um, so basically what I'm essentially needs to happen and what I'm trying to say is um, that AI tools basically need to be adapted to the justice environment taking into account uh, the principles and procedural architecture underpinning the judicial pro proceedings, which I just uh, set out at the, at the start of my presentation. Uh, that is, of course, not easy. I mean, uh, we see, of course, that <laughs> this is very challenging. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we believe that uh, this needs to be done very thoroughly. I hope I'm still... Many? Yeah, sorry, my computer is not working with me today. Do you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Carry on. You see my presentation? Yeah, but it's not full screen. Okay. Then uh, what I was saying, so AI tools must be adapted to the justice environment. And uh, there, there are a number of elements. Sorry, yes. I'll go back. Firstly, all the parts involved in a judicial process should always be able to identify within a judicial decisions the elements that, um, that resulting from the implementation of an AI tool. And there should therefore be a strict separation between data uh, or results uh, from the operation of an AI system and other data in, in the dispute. Um, then, under no circumstance, we believe, uh, should judges delegate all uh, their decision-making power to an AI tool. In other words, the right to a human judge should be guaranteed at any stage of the proceeding. And moreover, uh, when the court's decision is based on data or outcomes provided by an AI tool, the parties uh, and their lawyers should be given also the opportunity to access that tool and to assess its characteristics, uh, the, the data used by that tool uh, and the relevance of the outcomes it provides. That is a very important in the context of this uh, principle of uh, adversarial proceeding. And then it is also essential that the parties retain the opportunity to discuss um, uh, the, the, the outcomes and uh, that applicable data protection rules are of course also respected. And uh, finally, the neutrality and objectivity of the AI tools must be also uh, guaranteed and this must be verifiable as well. So uh, when deploying AI tools in the justice systems, uh, there are therefore strong needs in the area of fairness, accountability, and transparency. And again, therefore, the AI tool must be adapted to the justice environment and not the other way around uh, as, as portrayed in this image. Um, because, uh, and I, I do believe that there is a significant risk that over time with little steps, uh, this situation could arise um, and uh, because there is always a temptation to utilize uh, AI tools or technology in general uh, for the purpose of achieving uh, cost savings and efficiency gains rather than uh, as a means or we believe that it should be used as a means to enhance the quality of justice uh, but there might always be the temptation to use it just for the mere efficiency and cost savings uh, benefit. Um, so, um, I will now just highlight, because I know my time is running out, so um, uh, I will just highlight a few elements uh, re in relation to the use of AI in legal practice, and the next speakers will, will go into that 
much more in greater detail than I will do now. But nevertheless, I just want to indicate a little bit the direction the CCBE is, is thinking and, and what we are planning to do. Because of course, uh, we understand that uh, AI will also uh, it, uh, potentially transform the legal uh, services landscape. Um, I mean, with uh, what we, we look back 30 years ago with the advent of the internet, basically um, the internet made it possible that large amount of knowledge and information became available for everyone. What we see now with, with uh, the rise of AI is that it will become possible for anyone to apply complex and large amounts of knowledge and generate new content and other outputs based on, on an infinite amount of, of, of data um, just in a few seconds. So, of course, um, we are not there yet, and there might be all sorts of restrictions, and the next speakers will, will refer to this, but of course, this will also have an impact on legal services, and it, it also can empower uh, lawyers and clients uh, as they will be able to create faster and more efficient way to complete legal tasks. Um, so this is also the reason why we did this guide to also inform lawyers about these developments and how uh, they can also uh, look uh, at, at the use of these tools in their legal practice. So I already referred to our guide, which uh, also lists certain categories of uh, tasks that uh, could also be undertaken with the help of AI tools, such as legal ana analytics, document automation, advanced research, compliance and due diligence, uh, uh, assisted e-discovery, et cetera. Um, and, and again, um, we, will, we will definitely monitor these tools uh, but there are, of course, also uh, some, some difficulties which we encountered when we did uh, our uh, work in the course of the AI for Lawyers project, when we looked into what, what, what tools are there actually already for lawyers, and, and can they be used, and what about diff comparing different jurisdictions, are tools available in all jurisdictions, and we have analyzed that the European market is rather uh, fragmented. Uh, it, it, it consists of different market sizes, of different legal contexts, different languages, and that can, uh, of course, be an obstacle to the uptake of AI tools and to the, also the development, especially, of AI tools and the availability of AI tools for lawyers. So that, that, that could be a potential problem there that certain jurisdictions might not benefit from uh, the rise of AI as quick or, uh, or at all uh, compared to other jurisdictions. And um, there could therefore also be a lack of equal access to novel technologies, which might result also in, in, in a widening of IT capabilities of lawyers in different EU countries. There are issues then and, uh, in, in relation uh, to deontology, confidentiality issues, independence of lawyers, also um, issues of, of prof uh, that, that, that uh, relate to professional competence when lawyers, of course, use these tools uh, blindly, uh, without checking uh, the results. And we therefore believe that, um, ah, yes, I already mentioned the challenges and limits, uh, but therefore uh, we believe that um, there must be a digital empowerment of lawyers um, to ensure basically uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, to avoid a kind of, uh, to try to avoid a kind of inequality of arms or digital divide between, on the one hand, uh, lawyers and other actors in the field of justice, like uh, prosecutors or uh, the, 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 the judges themselves, that they have put, uh, possibly a certain AI tools or they know how to use them and lawyers not. So obviously there is a, um, yeah, an importance there to, uh, to empower also lawyers in this area. Also to increase uh, awareness uh, how these tools can be used in a way that it is compliant with the ontological rules. Um, empowering legal practitioners with digital skills is also necessary to ensure the proper functioning actually of justice because the dig digitalization of justice also largely rely on the extent to which the parties know how to use uh, digital tools. Uh, and so it is also in that interest. And um, 
well, that there could be also digital, better digital skills of lawyers could also contribute to the decrease of the so-called justice gap, um, namely the number of people with unmet justice needs, because of course, through the clever use of new technologies, um, lawyers might be able to also expand their uh, services to untapped markets um, at, at a lower cost, which before they would not be able to do so. So there are, of course, also potential opportunities uh, there. The question is, how can we empower lawyers and um, their... Um, yeah, the, the question is, is still out there and, and we are assessing this, but um, I mean, uh, it is clear that um, perhaps one of the most significant changes is the growing need of, for lawyers really to possess more advanced skills to critically interpret knowledge and to apply knowledge also in a creative way. And I still believe that basic skills such as legal research, writing and advocacy uh, will remain essential. Uh, but what is probably also becomes more important is um, is actually really to remain connected and fully aware with the sources of law and with the principles underpinning legal system, which I also try to set out uh, in, 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 in this presentation. And uh, then these competences need to be complemented with, with critical thinking, problem solving, creativity and obviously digital literacy to also find um, uh, or, or have the capacity, build up the capacity to find flaws in the interpretations uh, that are generated by machines, uh, not only for your own uh, use, but also for the opponents or the other parties use. Um, Simone, we should, uh, we should move to questions because there are really quite a few. Yes, uh, okay. If okay, I am, I'm ready for that. Yeah, I, I think actually the questions um, are mainly for your Danka. I hope your Danka is still online. And can you on your screen press, I should have interrupted you a long time ago. Well, you, you've gone now, that, it's gone. Uh, fine. Uh, thank you very much. Your Danka, are you still, you are wonderful, your Danka. Uh, Simone, the questions arise from what you say, but actually they're all go back to the European Commission uh, itself uh, and people interested to know about the, uh, the act. Uh, I go back to Carl Lauer's second question, and it arises from what you said, Simone, how do you expect the requirements for logs, traceability, transparency, etc., to be met when AI systems are black boxes in the sense that it's practically impossible to trace how an AI system comes to its results and recommendations? Jordanka. Yes, so yeah, that's the objective. And um, uh, again, to say that because we follow a horizontal approach, uh, actually those requirements are very much uh, phrased depending on the level needed of transparency, uh, depending on the different use cases and context of impact and relevance. Uh, so the transparency needed, we think, uh, of course, for certain systems like in the justice sector, or where we know, for example, we'll see whether it will be included in the end by the parliament, this right to an explanation. Um, but always, if that is needed, already under GDPR, you know, there are even some ca court cases where this is required, um, uh, that will be already applicable also and relevant for the design uh, of the system. So, because there are different uh, types of uh, AI and um, technologies, you could have, of course, a very black box um, machine learning, which might not be relevant for those use cases like um, high risk where people's rights are affected, but there could be also other ways uh, where there are tools to interpret, to give more transparency, uh, not only to document and to give global understanding how the system functions, but already for individual decision makings to have like local explanation. So this is, of course, a research field, but we've already seen uh, uh, a lot of technical solutions also to, uh, to achieve that. And uh, yes, I think that for certain sectors where you do need uh, re reasoned justification and explanations, you need to use more transparent system and not these black boxes. So that's the objective with the act uh, to ensure that. 
Thank you. And I see that there are questions coming in on the chat from Todo, Jacek, other people. Please put them in the question and answer box, not in the chat. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, going to another uh, question which has come in from Mario Paludi. Uh, which is uh, a very fundamental question. What is the legal basis and what kind of competence does the EU have in AI? AI impacts so many areas, justice, education, trade. Can the EU intervene in each of these by ensuring an acceptable level of uniformity in the face of national legislation? Um, yes, the legal basis and the EU competence is based on Article 114, which is the legal basis for the internal market, because AI systems as such are, um, are system software, it can be integrated in services, it can be integrated in products, and uh, uh, all these systems and products are already falling within the competence of the EU. So all the internal market legislation, including the latest proposals for the digital single market are based on 114. So this is also our legal basis. There have been long discussions. Uh, is this the only one? Should we also add, for example, the data protection legal basis? In our case, data protection is only added for the prohibition of real-time remote biometric identification because it's like leg specialis to already what we have in the EU data protection legislation. But for everything else, because these are horizontal rules applicable to all sectors and to software as such, um, it uh, was considered by all legal services that this is the, the right legal basis and also for the AI Act. Thank you. One, we'll, we should stop, but I'm going to creep in one more question because I want to use, so Peter, hang on there. Uh, will there, from Agnes Francia, will there be common rules <clears throat> regarding specific operational rules about the court's decision making, such as indicating which part AI was used, or are the member states to set out their own specific rules? And will clients be informed when AI is used or is only disclosed to organizations which review court decisions? Uh, on the first point, whether clients will be informed, as I mentioned, the parliament has proposed quite additional remedies and rights uh, to people. So one of them is that people should always be informed when AI is used. Uh, so that would certainly give more transparency uh, actively to be informed, not only to look if in that database, as I mentioned, now there will be this obligation that they'll have to register the use in the public database. But the parliament also proposes to uh, not only public authorities, but everyone to inform people if they are using high-risk AI systems. Um, now, on the other point, whether member states will be allowed to um, give more specific rules uh, for court uh, decision making, um, uh, it's an internal market legislation and it aims to create harmonized rules. So the objective is that you don't have different national rules on everything that is covered by the AI Act. And because it covers all AI systems, not only those that are high risk, we could update the list, uh, the list of high-risk AI systems, but all of them, in principle, for the risks to fundamental rights, health and safety, it's presumed that member states uh, cannot specifically create only for AI systems new rules. But of course, uh, there are rules that apply in general to courts or if they want to to give more specification, but not only AI specific, they can do that. And also there is one exception in the regulation for high-risk AI systems. There could be more obligations for the users of the systems. So for example, when courts are using them, yes, it's not excluded, but only for users of high-risk AI systems, but not in general for the technology providers or for low-risk AI systems. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Simone. Uh, we must move on uh, our next speaker who will be uh, speaking about the use of AI in legal practice 
is uh, Peter Homaki, who is one of our great experts, lawyer from the Hungarian Bar Association, former chair and current member of the CCBE's IT Law Committee, and author of the Guide on the Use of Artificial Intelligence-Based Tools by Lawyers and Law Firms in the EU. Uh, over to you, Peter, and you'll remember Joao's question from number one, which uh, at the beginning, which you agreed to what you'd answer. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, really, it's a pleasure to, to give you this presentation today. But as uh, Simone has mentioned, CCB and ELF have pub published this guide on the use of uh, AI for lawyers and law firms about a year ago. And uh, there are many things that have changed uh, since that time. But you know, my number one advice is still is read this guide. It's available in English and in Hungarian currently, but it gives you a lot more detail, including a much wider overview of the tools that lawyers can use. Uh, the 30 minutes that we have today is not enough to go to any depth. And of course, as all the other presentations, this will be made available. So if you can't read everything now from the slides in full, don't worry, you will find it. Uh, today, I will talk about part of uh, the issue of AI, which you know, was not really possible to get sufficient emphasis in the guide. And that is the specific type of foundational model for the large language models like uh, GPT-4. These large language models are increasingly dominant, but they are still not the best solution for every legal task. So what's a large uh, language model? It's a, it's, of course, it's a language model that is relying on sophisticated technology and is assisted by a huge data set that was trained on an enormous amount of data uh, built around neural networks. Language models themselves are just representatives of the probabilities of specific words calling each other. So they show the probabilities for a text sequence, depending on the earlier parts of the sequence, what will be the next part. You can already find some language models uh, from the late 19th century. So language models are not really a very new thing. But with the assistance of today's technology, the simple modeling can become so sophisticated that results in people considering it something like magical, like an artificial person is writing long essays for them. On this slide, you can see a very high level illustration of the currently most popular large language model, GPT-3. Uh, Actually, the most popular model is not GPT-3, but uh, GPT uh, by OpenAI. But the data on this slide is uh, related to GPT-3 because the next models, they do not really have very accessible and detailed information, reliable information, how they are made up. So the first step is just to translate uh, the words into tokens, you know, to numbers, which are because uh, computers are relying on numbers. And uh, the trick, the magic here is to make this transformation in a way that the words used retain the semantic meaning uh, by after the translation as much as possible. First, these input tokens that are representing the words are guided through a number of blocks, and these blocks in the bottom right corner are actually artificial neural network models. Uh, like in this case, 96 blocks are used. And after all these, out of these blocks, we receive the contextualized tokens. You know, these tokens, which now already provide a lot more precise meaning, contextual and embedding way of the, each token that were used, uh, what the actual meaning of the word was in relation to the full input, the full context. And from these contextualized tokens, the first response tokens are generated, then the next response tokens, you know, next words, because tokens are language specific, uh, but mostly they represent words or parts of words. So the next the generated tokens will take into account both the previous response tokens and the full original input as well. And this generation goes on and on until the large language model generates a stop token or some other parameter of the language model makes the model stop. And then these are turned back into text. What's important for us is that uh, the, these probabilities of uh, the, in the network 
are learned by way of first training. Uh, these neural networks on very large amounts of text uh, during what is called a self-supervised training. So first, large language models are trained during the training phase. And based on this training, they can provide predictions as to what the next words should be. These large language models are uh, relying a different way of computation that we usually use. And uh, it is not really something called explicit programming. It's not like defining everything in advance, how that should be working, uh, how to reach the required end result. Uh, these neural networks that are used in the large language models are trained on what we can call learning by examples. Uh, that is also something that a number of uh, speakers have already mentioned. You know, uh, that's also a reason of the some of the black box type of uh, functionalities, black box type of characteristics of these models. Just very briefly, let's take a look at uh, how these neural networks work. Of course, it's a very sophisticated subject. There is not really the best person to give you every detail in this. It would really itself need hours of training. But the point here is that it's a very different computing paradigm compared to what we are traditionally used to, which is called the von Neumann architecture. Now, neural networks, for neural networks, there is no such thing as a separate processing unit. There is no memory, no separate instructions that are fed into the uh, computer. Everything is included in this mesh that you can see on this slide, which is just a very simple example of a neural network. And these weights, uh, the lines and devices of the network do the processing, and they also serve as the memory, then they also represent the instructors. And uh, these all come uh, into existence by way of the training. So they transform this network transforms the input into the required output. In the next slide, I will just show you how large the family of uh, the large language models is. It is a very diverse family. Uh, if you call it, uh, we are living in a country, an explosion of large language models. The most popular branch, branch currently is the gray one, which is called a decoder only transformer based language models. But doesn't mean that lawyers will be using only these type of language models or that these are the best tools for all kinds of legal jobs. These are really technical details that uh, depend on the task at hand. So what difference will these large language models mean for us? Actually, from a very generic point of view, they just show up as a new layer of, on top of existing software, or they replace existing software parts. But in general, they make it possible to automate things that were not previously possible to automate or not reasonable to automate. In general, they provide improvements in language-centric computer capabilities. But the next question is why? Why now? And now we come back to the question in relation to the emergent properties. Why was there so much, uh, such a huge change in the capabilities of artificial intelligence? The field of research in artificial intelligence is uh, really quite old. It's, uh, the theoretical underpinnings are as old as the traditional computers, digital computers that we are using. But uh, the most important answer comes to uh, the form of the emergent abilities, which is a term used in complexity theory. This means that something like a small change, relatively small change, uh, quantitative change, can result in qualitative changes. There are new, and in our case, in the case of the neural networks, quite unexpected improvements in the performance of the tool. It's along the same line as just a human is not the same as a sum of all the cells making up a human. Or you know that a large flock of birds is really behaving differently than separately the birds. But uh, in this case, in our case, the problem is that people do not really know why and how these emergent abilities happened. Around 2018, 
uh, researchers have identified that if neural networks become more complex, they have more parameters to work with, then new and exciting abilities will appear, such as we can use the input that we send to the large language model as a kind of instruction for the model to work with a wide range of possible tasks. Before these abilities appeared, we had to first do a pre-training of the large language model and then fine tune the language model to each and every specific task that we wanted to use the model for. Like you had to different, do different fine tuning for the classification of judgments for two different specific legal subjects. And fine tuning is a resource intensive job and uh, you need to have access to specialists as well. Now, it seems that thanks to the increase in the number of parameters and thanks to the uh, this, what is called the in-context learning or also called uh, zero-shot or few-shot learning, we can now achieve very good results with these large language models in a way that we give only different kinds of instructions to the same large language model. And the model is now able to provide pretty good results without fine-tuning. There is another interesting emergent ability, uh, which uh, was that logic reasoning abilities of these large language models became also much better uh, compared to previous versions. But there are also other factors behind why we are using or why we are discussing large language models uh, so often nowadays, not just the emergent abilities. Uh, some of the companies, uh, experimented with fine-tuning these large language models to respond better to instructions. And this fine-tuning made the model uh, able to complete tasks better. And finally, uh, a major change was due to the ChatGPT product made public in November 2022, uh, because it was made available to a much larger audience uh, than before it. But the capabilities of large language models were already visible like for GPT-3, uh, for the developers and machine learning community late 2021, but uh, ChatGPT made it really visible for everyone and enjoyable for everyone. That's also something that we should not underestimate the uh, importance. So what do the large language models make possible for lawyers? Well, the most important thing is that the pool of experts that we can involve in automating our legal works has become a lot bigger because we no longer need machine learning engineers to automate all the legal tasks. It's enough to have access to consultants that have a general IT skill set, which is still better than most what most lawyers have. And these less skilled experts are more available in smaller countries as well. And lawyers can turn to these less skilled but more available experts and they will be able to have lawyers with uh, automation of the legal task in a lot more areas. And there will be second important change is that the implementation cost of legal automation is going down thanks to this. We don't really need costly data preparation, fine tuning. Uh, that was a major block uh, to the use of large language models for legal work. And we can also replace some complex software with simpler software, uh, thanks to the text generation capabilities of large language models, for example, in grammar uses, as you will say in my later examples. We can also use less tools uh, that can integrate better with fewer tools. But uh, what's also important for us is that we can use a conversational user interface as lawyers. In a number of cases, uh, they are more helpful than traditional uh, user interfaces that can become quite complex, you know, because you are relying on different many choices. And uh, sometimes it's easier to give what you read like uh, in words uh, to the computer. I would like to go through some very specific examples of using large language models. Uh, these are just screenshots from uh, the examples. So I'd not really going to explain to you all the details here. The first example is a tool that is starting with automatic speech transcription. Automatic speech transcription has been available for lawyers for a long time, but not for all languages and not at the same level uh, of quality. 
But now everyone can have access to free models that can handle a large number of languages and to transcript audio text into to written script. The quality of the transcription is pretty good uh, now. Even in Hungarian, as you can see in the example, the word error rate uh, is like 13% or 11%, which means that it is useful. And even up now, you have to review the results and you have to change it. It's a lot less work than trying to transcribe it from scratch. And this kind of review, you cannot really uh, avoid, even if you're using a human for transcription. So this the example here is just a front end for, the, for a free model uh, by OpenAI called Whisper. Uh, but Whisper is a speech recognition model. It's not a large language model, but this front end here is able to use that after the transcription has been done, you can send the text to a large language model like the GPT-4 here, uh, four here and they can do different kind of reductions. They can you know, change the text in certain ways, which are really useful. They can not only just for spell checking, they can do some kind of stylistic changes as well. And uh, it's a good approach uh, to experiment what could be useful in transcription. Now the next page is about contract automation. Contract automation is the oldest field in legal automation. It has been done since the late 1980s. And uh, large language models uh, do not work in a way, unfortunately, that you just give a three line or description of a model to create a contract for you. Lawyers are capable of doing that, but only as long as they know the context. You know, because if I know who the client is, uh, it's enough for the client to give me a very short description of what kind of contract they want. But I'm only capable of doing this if I had work uh, with that kind of client previously. Now you cannot give this kind of contextual information uh, to large language models very easily. And uh, that's why uh, large language models will not really replace the existing structure contact automation tools. But that they are not a replacement for these document automation systems. But they are very useful addition to them. And this example is showing you who, in what kind of fields are they good extension to existing tools. Uh, Hungarian language is pretty complex. And uh, my problem was with contract automation tools and uh, is that you have to draft the different provisions of which really not different in terms of the legal sense. They are just different in terms of the grammar, like how many parties there are uh, on each side. And even if you have a generic provision and you would like to have that generic provision be uh, used in a number of cases, it's quite complex to make all the um, necessary uh, changes in the Hungarian language. So uh, these large language models can be used in a way that I just did a very generic description on the left side uh, and a case specific description of how the replacements should be done. And then it gives me a properly worded language of the condition of the provision in the, to be used in the contract. And I can use this almost the same language for, for lease agreements or sale agreements. And that makes it possible for me just to retain generic provisions in the contract automation software and use the detailed instructions in the large language model to do the necessary transformations that are not really specific to the legal questions, which are more specific to the grammar only. And this works even for Hungarian, you know, or for similar small languages out of the box. And that also means very importantly that uh, lawyers across the EU will be able to use the same document automation so software across the borders. And that's very important because as we can see, the current market legal tech software market uh, within the EU is very fragmented due to the national and linguistic boundaries. The next question, next example is uh, called the legal open book question answering. Uh, also as known as the information retrieval here. 
you can ask uh, ChatGPT uh, any legal questions, of course, and they will definitely give you an answer. And the less you know about the area of law, like my example, North Macedonian contract law, the more convincing ChatGPT's answer will sound. But if you go into the details and you know what kind of answers uh, you should be receiving, uh, it turns out that ChatGPT's answers are not precise at all, not really useful. You should not be relying on it. But you can also use the GPT models, not ChatGPT itself, in a way that they should be giving you the answer based on specific parts of text that the model uh, is retrieving from a legal source and that you are providing the model from the legal source. In this case, uh, the response will not be based on the pre-training data of ChatGPT, but on documents uh, uh, the user has supplied. In case of my experiment, these documents were the Hungarian Civil Code, Hungarian Civil Procedure Code. I've tried to measure if the answers will be more precise this way. And uh, the legal texts are usually much longer than the limits of the GPT model called the maximum context length. So you first break up the text into the maximum size for a single input in the given language model, and then we convert these text parts into embeddings. If you remember uh, the slide on the large language model, this is the way that we have to convert text into numbers in a way that retains the semantic meaning of the text. Now the next step is to find what the most relevant text parts of the full legal source was, and uh, then retrieve these relevant text parts only. Just like you do in any kind of legal research information retrieval task, from these most relevant text parts, we're feeding these most relevant into the large language model like GPT-4 and ask GPT-4 to answer your question based on these text parts. As you can see, the results became much better this way. What's more interesting, I could take a look at what kind of questions are difficult for this method. Now, I've been using, a, just a minute, I've been using generic questions that laymen or lawyers would ask from a computer regarding these legal texts. But often these answers are not readily available in the legal text. They rely on multiple layers of definition that are spread across different text parts. GPT-4 could provide more convincing answers this way because 75% of the questions were answered correctly, uh, while with the ChatGPT version, this uh, rate was only 33%. So this was not a very precise experiment. It was just good to get a feeling of what kind of research could be done in this area. But this experiment has shown why lawyers need to have their own lawyer-focused benchmarks for question answering and similar tasks. Why there are already lots of benchmarks in the natural language processing, as you can see on this slide, they are not... I'm, I'm sorry to be sure. rude as to interrupt you, uh, but we have uh, questions, and I wonder if I could stop you so we could go to the question. Yeah, just just uh, two sentences and kind of sure. finish. Okay. So uh, the problem is that there are the number of benchmarks, but most of these benchmarks are by natural language processing specialists. It's for their purposes. But uh, if we want to use and compare tools in our own use of lawyers, uh, we have to define our own benchmarks, we have to see for ourselves how each tool is compared with each other. And of course, it would be quite useful to harmonize these benchmarks in a certain way between countries. So thank you. That's what I wanted to do. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, there's one question for you, um, and then Simone, get ready, because you and Simone, I'm going to bunch a lot of questions together about the same kind of principles. Livio Garavaldi wants to know, you didn't specifically mention this, what is the relationship between AI and smart contracts? Absolutely nothing. So uh, AI and smart contracts are not really related to each other in any way. Smart contracts are a specific kind of, uh, well, more like their code, software code, that are used in certain uh, digital ledgers, like uh, in Ethereum network, they're used, and they have a predefined function uh, available in certain blocks of the, in certain addresses of the blockchain there. So of course, AI could be using uh, smart contracts as well, but they are not really related. 
Thank you. Uh, there are three questions which are all about judges and the use of AI in different ways. So Jacek Kowalewski, and he actually addresses the CCBE, says that, do you think the current legal framework at the EU Council of Europe level and national level precludes that a judge could be also AI and not only a human? Does any CCB paper dwell on this? Ahmad Rafi Nadiri asks a very basic question, was how do you entrust an important judicial decision about a person's life or property to AI in the first place? And Areti Arvanti says, how do you make sure that AI tools which are used in the judicial process are not being used under the radar without it being communicated to the litigants or recorded? So I don't know, Peter, Simone, or anybody else, if you'd like to answer the principles behind those questions. Thank you. I, I can just start off saying uh, the first question regarding uh, whether EU rules preclude currently or maybe also the, the current draft of the AI Act would preclude the use of AI tools by uh, judges for for uh, or full use uh, of, of uh, an automatic decision making. I, I understood that was the question. I believe, I mean, it's not, uh, so the, the, this is governed, uh, usually the rules of, 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 of uh, judicial proceeding is, is not uh, an EU competence, so those are usually governed by the national rules, uh, so I think it is up to each national um, uh, government within the EU to, to outline and to set out uh, the, the, the specific rules in its own uh, justice system, and uh, of course there are uh, there are areas, uh, you know, for example, um, in relation to alternative dispute resolution, that uh, that could probably be a field where this um, decision making uh, could be more um, tested uh, initially, uh, especially in relation to uh, low value uh, disputes. Uh, so, so that could be a potential first uh, scenario where where these could be uh, could could emerge. But uh, at this stage, I do not believe that uh, the EU rules would preclude uh, this. Uh, Peter, do you have anything to add to that before we move to the next speaker? And sorry to be quick. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I think I would like to, to respond to that part, you know, how can it be secured that the AI tools will not be used without uh, communicated? Well, okay. if, uh, in relation to the use by the judges and uh, the courts, I think it's uh, like a question of trust. So if you don't uh, trust the courts that they are abiding by the laws, uh, we have our own uh, ways to, to challenge certain uh, decisions if there is any indications that some of the rules were not followed here. But uh, generally, I don't think that there is a silver bullet solution for this. So if we don't trust the judges, we don't trust the court, and the courts are not able to, uh, you know, to avoid this kind of breach of law, then of course we are in a bit of a problem and uh, it's not really easy to, to recognize that this has been breached. As for the other parties uh, to the judicial process, uh, they are not currently uh, in the current text, they are not really prohibited from, from uh, using uh, necessarily unless these are you know, the law enforcement or the prosecution. But as for them, I think we have the same kind of old tools of trying to make them uh, uh, responsible players in the judicial process. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent answers. Really, really good. And thank you, Peter, for your presentation. Thank you very much indeed. We should move on to our final speaker, who is Giovanni Battista Gallas, who will be speaking about the safe use of AI by lawyers, which is something we have been a theme throughout, the risks to avoid. Uh, and Giovanni Battista is a member of the Surveillance Committee of the CCBE and a regular speaker for the European Lawyers Foundation, uh, on data protection in data protection training. Uh, so very good, Giovanni Battista, uh, you're there. Can you put your slides up, please? And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's really a pleasure to uh, to talk in this seminar, which has been so interesting so far. I, I'm trying not to lower that much uh, uh, the bar of this presentation. So. Uh, I will talk about the, uh, the risks uh, so, and the, the risks have, have been already uh, highlighted in the rest of the presentation. But I will 
specific, specifically focused with, uh, with regard to the LLM. Why the large language models? Because as already uh, your Danka Ivanova pointed out, uh, LLMs are really where the competition is going at the present time. And also Peter, Peter Omoki stated that uh, they generated public awareness of the power of the artificial intelligence. So the, the use has been really widespread. And so I would focus my presentation on this topic. And I just have to remember that we all are under a duty of competence and our uh, Charter of Okov principles already covers the technological changes. So we have to uh, be aware of the benefits, but also on the risks of the relevant technologies in, in our practice. So this is very important to bear to bear in mind as a general as a general principle, but it, it is not uh, necessary to be as proficient as uh, Peter Omoki or all the other speakers. But we are uh, are under a duty to understand the the knowledge of understand uh, have a broad knowledge of the main system. It's absolutely paramount. It's a compulsory before using them in order to uh, avoid the mistakes which would which could be uh, really uh, costly uh, costly indeed and then uh, talking about mistakes we can learn from catastrophic mista mistakes and i think that many uh, or you, many of you already know uh, what happened in the mata versus avianca case it's a landmark case but for absolutely for the wrong reasons what happens in a few words? Uh, a lawyer uh, decided to use ChatGPT as a research tool in this case, and ChatGPT provided a list of cases uh, which uh, were completely made up. And uh, the other parties complained about the fact that those cases were not uh, to be found. And uh, the lawyer already asked again uh, the chat GPT and chat GPT provided some extra, extra, uh, expert of the case, some expert of the case, but also the experts were completely made up. So uh, they provided some absolutely uh, uh, invented cases before the judges and before the other parties. This happened in the uh, in the US and it's still happening. And this is the last memorandum, uh, the latest memorandum of uh, the uh, lawyers, the unfortunate lawyers, which who became world famous for this case. And uh, 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 they already pointed out that the situation is really unprecedented because they used a, a new highly touted research tool that obtained cases which were completely made up. And uh, the lawyer had no idea what happened. And they asked again, Chad GPT, and Chad GPT assured that the cases were real and they could be found on other uh, real uh, uh, search engines for uh, law, like Westlaw and LexisNexis. And the uh, lawyer didn't know that uh, Chad GPT was inventing the cases and uh, they, are, they profoundly apologize to the court. But why did I put this uh, memorandum? Because we have to learn from uh, mistakes. And this memorandum, even if the, the latest one, when they discovered the, the problems of uh, these large language models, but those problems are common also to other large language models, this, uh, this memorandum is useful to learn uh, from the mistake. What are, what are the mistakes? First mistake, uh, and we have to spot this mistake. The first mistake is that, uh, that in general, uh, ChatGPT or BARD or any other large language models are not search tools per se. So if you talk about uh, uh, ChatGPT or other large language model as a new highly touted research tool, then you're making total, you're not understanding how it worked and how Peter Dumoki uh, provided the explanation on how it worked or how it could be used. But it is not a research tool. It is not especially a search, a search engine. And so this is very important to understand. 
The second point, and it's, it's a, a tricky one, anthropomorphization. Why? Because uh, we tend to uh, insert a personality also to this kind of tools and anthropomorphize these kind of tools. And you can understand this anthropomorphization, which is really dangerous by the way the memorandum was drafted. ChatGPT assured, ChatGPT was making the case, continue to provide explanation as if it were a person. We always talk about artificial intelligence. We may talk about, especially with regard to LLM, to alien intelligence, in a sense that it gives you a wrong, it gives you maybe right answers, but you have to understand that the reasoning process, so to speak, is completely uh, different to the human reasoning. The reasoning, and you have to consider this aspect also because these large language models are prone to hallucinations. Hallucinations is a technical term. It's uh, as it, it happens in Mata versus Avianca, the cases were completely made up. No, uh, they bear no resemblance whatsoever with reality. So there are different types of hallucin hallucination which uh, have, uh, have been studied by, uh, the, by, especially by data science, which can uh, be classified as lies or nonsense or a source conflation, ju just mixing together different sources or also overindulgence. So we have to know that a large language models tend to uh, hallucinate as it happened in Mata versus Avianca. And also we have to consider another very human attribute uh, in uh, uh, the attribute to uh, attribute a meaning and the will to this kind of uh, answer to stochastic powers because we tend to uh, uh, attribute to tend, uh, as a human interlocutors we try uh, to uh, anthropomorphize as I said before these uh, uh, these uh, large language models and then we can run into costly uh, costly troubles. There is also another bias which has to be considered. It's a second fancy bias. Sorry about the difficult words and, and, uh, and my pronunciation is not the best, but uh, uh, it's the fact that uh, all the large language models tend to repeat the preferred answer uh, of to, for their uh, user. So this is really tradable so when they use in the legal uh, in the legal profession. But we have uh, another very important question, and is how to address the duty of confidentiality and professional secrecy with regard to this use of such powerful tool. And this is a huge problem, which has already uh, causes some consequences with regard to the use in the private sector. For instance, even Google warned these engineers uh, recently not to use a chatbot with regard to confidential data, even the own bad chatbot, which is from Google, uh, in order to, uh, to prevent the risk of leaking, uh, leaking data. This is really an important, an important part. And some, also some uh, other companies have already issued a ban on generative AI used uh, or of the fact that uh, uh, employees could put confidential information in chatbot or in generative AI systems uh, because uh, it, they, it may be ingested by this AI system and it can be used also, as we will uh, deal in a, in a second, uh, it can be used also for training, for training purposes, and so it can be, in theory, also uh, also uh, made available to other uh, to other users and i'm not talking about cyber security i'm talking as a future uh, i'm talking about a few as a feature of these uh, uh, of these large language models and this is openly stated in the open ai terms and condition it says that if you don't use an api but you use uh, the uh, usual uh, usual chatbot, then they can use your content to improve your service and to train to improve their services and to train their uh, their um, their models. So in 
to put it in a very simple way, uh, all the content you provide in the chat, not using the API, unless you opt out, can be used uh, as a train for training purposes. So in theory, it may even be uh, part of an answer to another uh, to another user. That's why many companies, as I said before, are very worried about the use in uh, in the company environment. And I think that lawyers could be even more worried. Uh, about uh, about this fact, there may be an answer, uh, an answer uh, trying uh, to use systems which are based on pre software and they are private. They are they can be also safe hosted as private GPT, which is unfortunately, as far as I know, and also uh, Peter pointed out the uh, pointed out this fact, it may work only. Uh, in uh, in English, but still key, it keeps your data private. You're not using a cloud service, a cloud service, not, not using a service which may use your uh, data uh, for training purposes and incorporate your data in, uh, in the training data set. And this is uh, pretty peculiar and it can uh, uh, it can uh, le uh, lead to uh, worrisome uh, consequences. And there is another risk, uh, and I'm not talking about the risk of discrimination, the lack of transparency. We already dealt uh, when, and some other uh, speakers already dealt with it. But there is also another peculiar risk uh, that has to be pointed out. The end of electronic evidence as we know it, the generation of deep fake, of voice deep, deep fakes, of uh, AI generated images is a real risk for the whole field of digital evidence, digital forensics, and therefore for uh, providing digital evidence to the court because it introduces a level of uncertainty that was not so huge, that is becoming more and more important and may, uh, may uh, challenge any kind of electronic evidence. So we have also to consider this, uh, this aspect. And so what, what are the possible solutions? Well, one, on the, of one solution is a, a drastic one, which has been uh, implemented by uh, a Texan court, Judge B Bradley, uh, Brantley, sorry, Judge B Brantley Star, which uh, just decided that uh, they, every, every, all attorneys and litigants, they have uh, to provide a certificate that attests that they are not using any, they are not drafting any of the filings with generative artificial intelligence or that they are checking the artificial intelligence generated text for accuracy using other sources. Uh, and uh, it's also important to point out how this judge justifies the, this, uh, uh, this order. It justifies this order because the programs are unbound by any sense of duty, honor, of justice. And so they are based on programming rather than principle. This is uh, a, a solution, maybe a solution quite, uh, quite a, drastic, a drastic one. But uh, coming to uh, the conclusion, uh, we can we go back to Mata versus Avianca because we, uh, there has been a development just a couple of days uh, ago and uh, in the, the, the judge decided to sanction the two unfortunate lawyers who used uh, ChatGPT for painting cases. And uh, it, when sanctioning them, uh, the judge uh, pointed out some very interesting uh, issue. It says that technologies are commonplace and so as uh, a lawyer, we have we are kind of under a duty to use them in order 
as uh, Simone Cuomo pointed out, to expand our services, uh, to uh, give ad more advanced services. But uh, as uh, lawyers, we have to be the gatekeepers of the accuracy of the filings. This role is very important. Um, as uh, as Panagiotis uh, uh, Perakis pointed out, the human factor, the blend of legal skill and compassion is paramount. So in this case, the lawyers have been sanctioned because they abandoned their responsibilities. They didn't act uh, the, as gatekeepers, even if, uh, even when, uh, uh, also the, the other defendants pointed out that the cases were made up. I think we have to reach the duty of competence uh, high enough in order to be effective gatekeepers. And this is the only way, in my opinion, in which we can, minim we can use the tools which are extremely useful, useful in different scenarios, but while minimizing the risks. The duty of competence, the, uh, uh, the lawyer as a gatekeeper will be the right way in order to uh, gather the benefits of these, uh, uh, of these hugely powerful uh, tools. And that's what we have to do. And that's what the future will hold for us, in my, uh, in my opinion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, maybe uh, even uh, ahead of time, but uh, uh, I hope that uh, this will be uh, useful for more questions. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Giovanni Battista. You raised some really fundamental points, and I'm very surprised that there are no questions. The, <laughs> end, the end of e-evidence, the role of lawyers as gatekeepers. I mean, it's uh, thank you for, for raising those uh, extremely fundamental points, uh, which we should all consider. Um, I, I hope all our panelists are there, because there are some general questions which remain from before. Um, and uh, so so I would like to uh, put them forward. Um, and so, uh, the, so Elena Uzunova asked two questions a lot earlier, uh, which is, first of all, I, I, what would be the criteria for regulating AI that is not used for judicial purposes? Article 69, I believe. This may be for you, Jordanka. And she also says that considering the similarities with the money laundering uh, legislation already in place, how are new governance bodies in both sectors, I assume she means AI and money laundering, going to coexist? Uh, the risk categories have the same name, but there'll be different criteria. How will they coexist? I don't know whether anybody wants to comment on either of those questions. Anybody going to volunteer? No, that's all right. Um, we maybe, will... maybe I can just briefly say that I think it's indeed very relevant to have the codes of conduct uh, to address things that are, we'll see what will be in the final AI Act, but if they are not explicitly addressed there with mandatory rules on the coexistence of different regulatory authorities uh, and categories, um, it's important to say that this legislation is without prejudice to already existing requirements in other legal acts. So they all apply. Now for our AI Act, we do have proposed also the competent supervisory authorities in certain cases to take also responsibilities to monitor enforcement of the AI Act, but the governance system is also still under question. So for example, the parliament proposes to have only one national supervisory authority that is coordinating everyone. Other member states want more flexibility. So we'll see what will be the final landing zone. Thank you. And Peter, well, Pete and Giovanni, this may be one. So could you tell us a bit more about the difference between large language models and foundation models? Peter, I look to you, but I'll yeah, be yeah. I, uh, the difference here is that uh, like foundation models are not necessarily related to language processing. They can be used in, in image processing, image creation models, and then can they can be used in more generic use cases. But actually, the two are quite similar in terms of they are both 
a tools that can be used for lots of things, not just specific tasks, but for really a large number of tasks. Uh, the foundation model, the term as foundation model, I think is a bit older than the, uh, the term large language model. But uh, actually the difference is not as important between the two, it's more of, of the, uh, you know, it's a historical context of how these terms have developed. Thank you, that question from, thank you very much, Peter. That was from Adriana Yachinksa. Um, and the last question uh, is really, it comes from Genoveva Sotirova. It's about the protection of, I suppose it's the relationship between GDPR and AI regulation. And I mean, Giovanni Battisti mentioned a bit about this, <laughs> about how the large language models chew it up and spit it out again so that you have no protection. But I mean, how can you make sure that GDPR is uh, protected? Well. Can, can I jump in? Yes, please, please. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, the future AI Act uh, um, will coexist with the GDPR regulation and it will strengthen uh, also the application of the GDPR in the field of AI. Uh, you cannot be sure, uh, and uh, this one of the points is why, for instance, the Italian Data Protection Authority uh, issued an order against open AI with regard to the use of personal data. I think that uh, one of the ways it may be a proactive activity by the user uh, with access requests, uh, with other, uh, with uh, limitation uh, requests, with exercise of the rights in order to and better understand the boundaries of uh, the processing by the, such language, la, large language models, which they are very difficult uh, to uh, be put in line with the GDPR principle, just like uh, the uh, general principle under art, Article 5 of the, of the GDPR. Thank you, thank you. We have reached the end. Adina Lupu, you ask a very interesting question about how lawyers can check if video evidence has been altered by AI programs. But really, we've absolutely reached our limit now. Uh, so I should bring this to an end. Um, and so I'd really like to thank our speakers very much. I shall give a symbolic round of applause since uh, the participants can't do that themselves. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you to the participants for the excellent questions that you asked, which made this a lively and interactive session. Uh, thank you to all. Goodbye and see you all again. Bye. 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 Thank you.